as we delve into the story of Giv'on, we may notice an interesting underlying pattern woven into some of the biblical accounts surrounding this ancient city. The pattern I'm referring to is the interconnectedness between different events throughout time. It is the idea that actions have consequences, that they set in motion a ripple effect that influences the outcome of future events. It is the revelation of meaning behind seemingly arbitrary occurrences that, when understood against the backdrop of the greater picture, display profound significance. Indeed, it is the comprehension of the often synchronistic nature of reality, the notion that nothing is random. As much as we wanted to produce a video about ancient Givon, we were somewhat dismayed by the fact that we couldn't visit the actual site. This is because following the Oslo Accords signed between Israel and the Palestinians in the 1990s, Biblical Giv'on was left under Palestinian civil control and became strictly off-limits. It is only on very rare occasions that the IDF allows organized groups, accompanied by a heavy military escort, to visit the site. Well, it just so happens to be that as we began working on this film, we got word that one of these rare trips was about to take place and so of course we jumped on the bandwagon and were thankfully able to visit Givon and get a glimpse of what the actual site looks like today. Givon, which can be translated as Little Hill, is located 8 miles northwest of Jerusalem on a hilltop near the southern outskirts of the Arab town of El Jib, which preserves Givon's ancient name. As early as the 17th century, the traveler Franz Ferdinand of Tirol, Austria, proposed identifying El Jib with ancient Givon, and in the 18th century, the British traveler Richard Pocock made a similar observation. Still, it wasn't until 1838 when the American biblical scholar and geographer Edward Robinson presented a scholarly argument for identifying El Jib with biblical Givon that this identification was solidified. In 1870, a first survey of the site was carried out by a team belonging to the British Palestine Exploration Fund, and in 1890, a plan of the city's underground water system was published by the renowned German scholar Konrad Schick. It is quite likely that this very water system, published by Schick, is referred to in the book of Jeremiah as the great waters that are in Givon. This was the location to which Ishmael son of Netanyah fled following his assassination of Gedaliah son of Achikam, the governor of Judah appointed by the Babylonians after the destruction of Jerusalem. Between the years 1956 and 1962, James Bennett Pritchard conducted archaeological excavations at Givon on behalf of the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania. Among the many discoveries revealed by Pritchard's excavations was evidence for industrial-scale wine production dating to the late First Temple period. This included installations such as wine presses, conduits, and settling basins. But even more impressive, was a discovery of 63 cisterns that functioned as climate-controlled wine cellars, providing a perfectly stable storage temperature of 65 degrees and an estimated total storage capacity exceeding 25,000 gallons. It is interesting to note that during this time, Givon had been part of the Kingdom of Judah and hence may very well have provided both the city of Jerusalem and the temple with wine. This possibility finds further confirmation thanks to a tiny seal impression discovered in a first temple period refuse pit located on the eastern slopes of the Temple Mount. This ancient Hebrew impression bears the inscription Give On to the King and had originally been attached to a shipment of agricultural produce delivered as a tax to the royal storerooms in Jerusalem. And speaking of ancient Hebrew inscriptions, Probably the most remarkable discovery made by Pritchard's team at Givon was a collection of some 30 clay handles inscribed with the word Givon in ancient Hebrew. Apparently they had broken off storage jars used for the distribution of the wine produced at the site. These important inscriptions indeed prove the site's correct identification beyond the shadow of doubt. But as fascinating as these archaeological discoveries are, they don't convey the full story of Givon. And so now, to learn more about this important city, we turn to the biblical account.
This is the story of Givon. The little hill over which the sun stood still. A place where fierce battles waged and where the forces of nature raged. A place where sacrifices were offered by kings and where dreams foretold of great things. A place that reminds us, lest we forget, that a covenant is sacred and must be kept. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, Joshua and the Israelites crossed the River Jordan and entered into the Promised Land. By then, the local inhabitants had already heard rumors regarding a nation of former slaves making its way through the desert after being miraculously freed from Egypt. The book of Exodus describes how all the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. But following the miraculous destruction of the city of Jericho, and the capture of Ai, these were no longer rumors. In fact, the fear was now so real that the inhabitants of Canaan, made up of diverse nations, were willing to put away all their differences and unite against this common enemy. And so, as described in chapter 9 of the book of Joshua, they gathered together with one accord to fight Joshua and Israel. That is, all except for the inhabitants of the city of Givon, the Gibbonites, who adapted an alternative approach and determined to negotiate a peace treaty with the Israelites. The book of Joshua relates that, other than Givon, their primary city, the Gibbonites lived in three additional cities, namely Kfira, Be'erot, and Kiryat Ya'arim. Givon, Kfira, and Be'erot were situated in the western area of the allotment eventually given to the tribe of Benjamin, while Kiryat Ya'arim was located on the borderline between Benjamin and Judah. The book of Joshua also relays that the Gibbonites belonged to the Hivite nation. Now, since the Hivites are not mentioned anywhere else other than in scripture, we don't know that much about them. Though some believe that they were descendants of the Hurrians, who were an ancient Bronze Age nation that lived in northern Mesopotamia. Other than the enclave of the four Gibbonite cities, the Hivites were also recorded in scripture as living on Mount Lebanon, on the Mount Hermon foothills, and in Shechem. But whoever the Hivites were, they comprised one of the seven nations residing in Canaan prior to the conquest. And so, according to biblical law, the Israelites were forbidden from signing a treaty with them. Realizing this, the Gibbonites resort to one of the oldest tricks in the book, deception. The Bible describes how the inhabitants of Givon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, and they also acted with guile, and took worn sacks for their donkeys, and wine bottles rotten, split, and tied together, and worn patched shoes on their feet, and worn garments upon them, and all the bread of their provisions was dry and moldy. And so disguised as people who have come from afar, they asked Joshua and the Israelites to make a covenant with them. Initially, the Israelites were somewhat suspicious of the Gibbonite story. But after some words of persuasion, the Israelites succumbed to the Gibbonite deception, and the Bible tells us that Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. Now the Gibbonites' eagerness to trick the Israelites into this treaty can be understood on several levels. First, as we familiarize ourselves with the geography of the area, we learn that Giv'on was of strategic importance for controlling the land and, hence, may have been next in line for the Israelites' conquest efforts. The Bible indeed considers Giv'on to have been quite the stronghold, describing it as a great city and that all her men were mighty. But more importantly, Giv'on is situated near a central east-west, north-south crossroads. This crossroads is comprised of an important route that ascends eastwards from the coast and lowlands through the ancient city of Gezer, the valley of Ayalon, and the Beit Choron ascent, and merges with the main north-south highway that traverses the watershed along the central hills of Israel. And so, capturing Giv'on would ultimately have allowed the Israelites to advance southward towards Jerusalem and Hebron, and westwards towards the coast. So perhaps realizing that they were scheduled for a visit by Joshua and his army, 
the Gibbonites got cold feet, as it were, and were willing to utilize deception to save their skin. But something doesn't quite make sense. How was it that the Israelites were fooled so easily? Were they that gullible, or is there perhaps some deeper underlying reason behind this chain of events? In the first verse describing the deception of the Gibbonites, we read that they also acted with guile. Now this is by all means an odd choice of words, suggesting that there is more to the story than meets the eye. The verse which seems to be hinting at an event that took place at another time and place begs the obvious question, who else acted with guile? Now before we attempt to answer this question, let us examine the events preceding the description of the Gibbonite deception. Sandwiched in between the biblical accounts describing the capture and destruction of the cities of Jericho and Ai and the account relating the Gibbonite deception is a description regarding the important ceremony of the renewal of the covenant that took place in Shechem. This event, which included the building of an altar by Joshua upon Mount Eval, the writing of a copy of the Law of Moses on stone, and the reading of the blessings and the curses, is puzzling for two reasons. First, the placement of this event within the biblical texts seems to be chronologically out of context. This is because the biblical commandment regarding the ceremony found in Deuteronomy 27 states that it was supposed to have taken place on the day the children of Israel crossed the river Jordan and entered into the land. Secondly, the Bible does not mention any battles fought prior to the ceremony, indicating that, as opposed to many other parts of the land, the Israelites were able to enter the area of Shechem peacefully. So how was it that the Israelites were able to enter the area of Shechem without conflict? Who was it that previously acted with guile? And why was this event, the renewal of the covenant near Shechem, inserted directly before the description of the Gibbonite trickery? To answer these questions, we have to recall an earlier event that occurred in Shechem during the time of Jacob. In Genesis 34, we read that shortly after Jacob returns to Canaan with his family and pitches his tent near Shechem, his daughter Dina is kidnapped and violated by Shechem, son of Chamo, who the Bible describes as a Hivite. While Dina is held hostage, Chamo, the Hivite prince and his son Shechem, plead with Jacob and his sons to allow Dina to be wed to Shechem in return for generous, peaceful, and economic relations. Now what happens next is the answer to the first question we asked. Who else acted with guile? The Bible describes that the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Chamo deceitfully, convincing them that the only way forward was for every male inhabitant of Shechem to be circumcised. Chamo and Shechem agreed to the terms dictated by the sons of Jacob and convinced the entire male population of Shechem to undergo circumcision. This allowed Shimon and Levi to rescue their sister from the hands of Chamo and revenge the wrongs that have been done to her by carrying out a devastating attack that didn't end well for the inhabitants of Shechem. This answers the second question we asked and explains how Joshua and the Israelites were able to enter the area of Shechem without a battle. Apparently what Shimon and Levi had done to its inhabitants had left a long-lasting impression. Perhaps this is another reason why the Gibbonites were all so eager to make peace with the Israelites. Did they remember the stories of what Shimon and Levi had done to their Hivite ancestors at Shechem? As to the third question, why was the renewal of the covenant near Shechem inserted directly before the description of the Gibbonite trickery? It appears as if the Bible was hinting at a connection between the events surrounding the city of Shechem during the time of Jacob and those involving the Gibbonite trickery during the time of Joshua. And these events indeed seem to mirror one another. Both involve members of the Hivite nation negotiating with the Israelites shortly after they enter the land. And in both events, one party deceives the other. Both events even share the commonality of the deception being revealed on the third day. In other words, the Bible seems to be indicating that the events surrounding the Gibbonite trickery were no less than a rectification for the events that occurred at Shechem during the time of Jacob. Previously, we read that Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. 
The word for covenant used in the original Hebrew Bible is brit, which is the same word used to denote circumcision. A fascinating idea brought down in the Jewish mystical tradition suggests that the covenant made with the Gibbonites indeed involved their circumcision as well. Thus, the two events find yet another similarity, only that this time the record was finally set straight. While the sons of Jacob tricked the inhabitants of Shechem to undergo circumcision in order to kill them, during the time of Joshua, the Gibbonites tricked the Israelites into making a covenant with them to let them live. One last similarity between the two events is the fact that the perpetrators of the deception ended up being rebuked, even cursed. As described in Genesis 49, while Jacob gives his final blessing to his sons who are gathered beside him in Egypt, he takes the opportunity to criticize Shimon and Levi for what they have done, proclaiming, Cursed be their wrath, for it is mighty, and their anger because it is harsh. I will separate them throughout Jacob, and I will scatter them throughout Israel. Similarly, when the deception of the Gibbonites is revealed, Joshua summons them and proclaims, Now therefore you are cursed, and some of you shall always be slaves, hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. But Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to continue to this day in the place which he should choose. So we notice that Joshua's curse actually holds within it a blessing in disguise. Although the Gibbonites were to become slaves, their service won't be for mundane purposes, but for the house of the Lord. In striking resemblance, we learn that Jacob's curse as well holds within it a blessing in disguise. Yes, the tribe of Levi would become separated and scattered throughout Israel, but for a good cause. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to Him, and to bless in His name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no allotment or inheritance with his kindred. The Lord is his inheritance, as the Lord your God promised him. Having no portion of his own, the tribe of Levi was allotted 48 cities scattered throughout the land, 13 of which were designated for the Kohanim, the priestly descendants of Aaron. Remarkably, one of these 13 cities was none other than the city of Givon. When Adonitzedek, the Amorite king of Jerusalem, hears about the treaty made between Israel and the Gibbonites, he realizes that southern Canaan has effectively been compromised. So he joins forces with four other southern Canaanite rulers, namely the kings of the cities of Hebron, Yarmut, Lachish, and Iglon, and together they rally their forces in preparation for an attack on the city of Givon. The Gibbonites, who could not take on the coalition of the five kings on their own, call upon their newly acquired allies. Joshua honors the covenant and immediately mobilizes his forces. The epic battle that followed began with an impressive endurance feat. Joshua and his warriors embark upon a night-long forced march from their camp at Gilgal, located near the River Jordan, all the way through the desert and up the mountains until they arrive at Givon at the break of dawn. And then, with the rising sun behind them, Joshua and his men attack the coalition of the Amorite kings, causing complete mayhem and forcing them to retreat westwards. The Bible then describes great stones from heaven that fell upon the fleeing Amorites as they attempted to escape through the well-known Beit Choron ascent. The verses tell us that this perfectly timed meteorite shower killed more Amorites than those the Israelites killed with the sword. Incidentally, it was on the same steep and narrow Beit Choron ascent, where more than a thousand years after Joshua's time, Judah the Maccabee devastated the Syrian Greek army led by General Siron, and even further down the line, during the initial stages of the great revolt against Rome, Jewish rebels overpowered the retreating forces of the Roman general Cestius Gallus. But back to Joshua. By midday, the battle was far from over and victory not yet complete. It was at this point that Joshua uttered his famous and unique decree. Sun, stand thou still at Givon, and thou moon in the valley of Ayalon. The words that to this day reverberate through the pages of scripture and eons of time, 
and remind us that when we're aligned with heaven, the heavens align with us. To me, the events surrounding the battle at Giv'on provide us with yet another example of seemingly coincidental occurrences that are anything but random. You see, if not for the deception of the Gibbonites, there would have been no covenant between them and the Israelites. And if not for the covenant, the Gibbonites wouldn't have been attacked by the coalition of the five Amorite kings. Joshua's abiding by the treaty and coming to the Gibbonites' aid ended up providing the Israelites with the unique opportunity to simultaneously defeat five kings who ruled over key city-states, including Jerusalem and Hebron. This battle, in turn, enabled Joshua and the Israelites to conquer vast areas of southern Canaan. Similarly, it was the joint attack by Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in the 1967 Six-Day War that allowed Israel to defeat all three armies simultaneously and liberate vast regions of her homeland, namely the Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula, Judea and Samaria, including the area of ancient Givon, and of course, the old city of Jerusalem. As to the awesome celestial displays that played out on that fatal day, they too could have been explained away as random natural occurrences. And indeed, many have attempted to trace the astronomical mechanisms behind these events. However, it is important to remember that it's not necessarily the supernatural origin of an event that defines it as a miracle, but rather it's timing that makes it so. Another amazing discovery revealed by Pritchard's excavations at Givon was an ancient pool which he described as one of the most remarkable feats of engineering ever achieved in ancient Israel. The pool, which was dug into the bedrock using only hand tools, is nearly 40 feet in diameter, more than 80 feet deep, and with the help of 79 spiraling steps, provided access to a spring below. So apparently the ancient inhabitants of Givon indeed went on to become drawers of water, just as Joshua had intended them to. But it was also this very pool, the Pool of Giv'on, that became the setting for one of the most infamous battles recorded in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, we read that after the death of King Saul, David settled in the city of Hebron, where he was anointed as king of Judah, while at the same time, Ish-bosheth, the son of King Saul, ruled from Machanaim over the rest of Israel, following his installment by Avner, the commander of Saul's army. Shortly after these events, we read about an encounter that took place at the Pool of Givon, between the forces of Ishbosheth, led by Avner, son of Ner, and those of King David, led by Yoav, son of Tsuya. The verses portray a tense face-off between the opposing parties, describing how one group sat on the one side of the pool, while the other sat on the other side of the pool. Now it's important to understand that this meeting was anything but random, since during this time, Givon was a very important city. In fact, it was probably the most important city, as we shall later see. But Givon was also a key city associated with the house of Saul. As indicated by 1 Chronicles, which lays out his family's origin and genealogy, not only did King Saul's family originate from the city of Givon, his grandfather is referred to as the father of Givon, meaning that he was actually the very founder of the first Israelite settlement in the city. So now that it was time for King David to take his place as king over all of Israel, there needed to be a final showdown, as it were, between the house of David and the house of Saul. And what a better place for such an event to play out other than in King Saul's home court. But instead of engaging in a full-out war, Yoav and Avner agreed to settle the conflict by way of champion warfare, as they famously proclaimed, let the young soldiers arise and duel before us. In this ancient method of warfare, a contest was arranged between two elite warriors of each opposing force, the outcome of which decided the entire battle. While these contests were usually fought as a duel between two warriors, similar to the well-known battle between David and Goliath, the battle near the Pool of Giv'on was fought as a group duel between 24 men, 12 from each party. The number 12, of course, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. But apparently both sides were of equal skills, and hence 
the battle didn't play out as it was intended to. Instead of one side emerging victorious, the contest turned into a gruesome bloodbath. The verses describe an intense combat scene whereby each grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side and they fell down together. Now that the contest ended in a tragic draw, a full-on battle ensued and the forces of Yoav were ultimately victorious. The victory, however, came at a high price, which included the death of Yoav's brother Asael, one of David's prized warriors. As the dust finally settled, both parties understood the magnitude of the situation, agreeing that there needed to be an end to the bloodshed. It was then that Avner famously called out, must the sword consume forever? Yoav then blew the shofar, signaling his warriors to lay down their weapons. It was the battle at the Pool of Giv'on and the decisive victory of Yoav and David's men over Avner and the men of Ishboshet that ultimately became the event that allowed King David to secure his throne as the king over all of Israel. But it wasn't King David's last association with the city of Giv'on, for there was still some unfinished business. The second book of Samuel tells of a three-year famine that plagued the land of Israel at an undisclosed point during King David's reign. Realizing that nothing is random, King David seeks the counsel of the Lord and is answered that the enduring famine is for Saul and for the house of blood, for his having killed the Gibbonites. The Bible also informs us that the ultimate reason behind King Saul's actions was his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. However, the verses don't elaborate regarding the timeline or circumstances in which Saul's actions took place. One tradition states that Saul killed seven members of the Gibbonites during his massacre of the priestly town of Nov. It was during this time that the tabernacle was located there and therefore, according to this tradition, the Gibbonites killed by Saul had served in the sanctuary, just as Joshua had intended. Another possibility is that Saul killed the Gibbonites during a purge he carried out against the idolatrous practices. As the Bible mentions that Saul eliminated the necromancers and Yidoni diviner from the land. But perhaps the simplest explanation involves competition over limited resources. When the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, the tribe of Benjamin was comparatively a medium-sized tribe, yet the allotment given to him was one of the smallest and certainly the narrowest of all the portions. Moreover, much of his land wasn't particularly hospitable. The desert oasis that is the city of Jericho in the easternmost part of the allotment was not to be rebuilt following Joshua's decree. Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises and builds the city Jericho. The forbidding desert west of Jericho was not suitable for settlement and much of the fertile area in the western part of the allotment comprised the Gibbonite enclave. This left only a thin strip of land on the watershed and the semi-arid area that is the desert fringe to its east for the Benjamites to settle in. This meant, of course, that the tribe of Benjamin was left at a significant disadvantage following the treaty with the Gibbonites. And so it's reasonable to assume that the Gibbonites were killed during a campaign launched by King Saul in an attempt to drive them out of their land so that the tribe of Benjamin could settle the western area of their allotment. However, even though Saul's actions were done with good intentions for his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah, they were nevertheless an egregious violation of the oath sworn to the Gibbonites and hence evoke the wrath of God. King David therefore immediately summons the Gibbonite leadership with the hope of setting things straight. The Gibbonites then make it very clear that it is not riches they are after, nor are they interested in random acts of vengeance against the people of Israel. What they want is direct vengeance against King Saul through his immediate lineage. The man who annihilated us and who schemed against us that we be eliminated from remaining with the entire border of Israel, let seven men of his sons be given to us and we will hang them before the Lord. The Gibbonites specifically ask for seven of Saul's descendants as a symbolic retribution for his violation of the oath. You see, 
The word seven in Hebrew, sheva, shares a common root with the word shvuah, meaning oath. And as apparent from his own words put down in Psalms 24, King David most definitely understood the value of an oath. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, and who may stand in the place of his sanctity? One with clean hands and pure heart, one who has not sworn in vain by my soul, and has not sworn deceitfully. For this very reason, he remembers his oath sworn to his best friend Jonathan, and does not include his son Mephibosheth among those handed over to the Gibeonites. Still, the difficult decision had to be made as to who would be handed over. These included two of Saul's own sons, born to him by his concubine Ritzpah, daughter of Ayah, together with five of his grandsons, born to his daughter Merav. The Bible holds nothing back as it describes how King David delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. All seven of them fell together. What followed is one of the most heartbreaking scenes described in the Bible. Ritzpah, the daughter of Ayah, spent days, perhaps weeks, beside her loved ones, shielding their bodies and preventing their desecration by wild animals. The verse describes how she took sackcloth and spread it for herself over a rock, from the beginning of the harvest until water poured down from heaven. She did not allow the birds of heaven to descend upon them during the day, nor the beasts of the field during the night. The Hebrew wording of this verse implies that the rain that fell following the killing of Saul's descendants was not the blessed rain all were hoping for, but rather a sign of wrath. In fact, the Hebrew word that describes this rain, the word nitach, is one of the words used to describe the plague of hell that befell Egypt. This hard rain fell during the harvest season, destroying the little crops that grew in the third year of the famine. One of the first questions that comes to mind when reading the story is, if the reason behind the three-year famine was a sin committed by Saul, why did it occur during King David's reign? The Jewish tradition, as recorded in the Talmud, actually provides an answer to this question, offering a completely new way of understanding the reasons behind the famine. We previously read that when David inquired of the Lord, seeking an explanation for the famine, he was answered that it is for Saul and for the house of blood. Expanding upon this verse, the Talmud and tractic Yevamot explains that the famine was actually not the result of a single event, but rather of two. According to this teaching, the words for Saul imply that the Jewish people were punished because King Saul was not laid to rest properly following his death during the battle against the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. The words for the house of blood, on the other hand, refer to the more obvious reason being Saul's killing of the Gibeonites. King David had apparently thought that by handing over Saul's descendants, the matter would finally be settled. But when the hard rain fell following their slaying, it was a clear sign that the wrath of heaven had not yet lifted. It hadn't lifted because the descendants were left disrespectfully hanging in the open field, and it was King David who was expected to intervene on their behalf and provide them with a proper burial. But even more importantly, it was a reminder to him that King Saul himself, together with his son Jonathan, were left buried in Yavesh Gilad in Transjordan and hadn't been returned to be properly buried in their ancestral plot in the land of Benjamin. It was by the unabated devotion, dedication, loyalty, and compassion of a mother, Ritzpah, the daughter of Ayah, that King David had realized that the reason behind the continued wrath upon the land of Israel and its inhabitants was because he had failed to show the proper respect for its former king and his lineage. It was by her actions that he finally understood what needed to be done. David immediately arranged a proper burial for King Saul's descendants and had the bones of King Saul and his son Jonathan brought back and buried in their ancestral tomb in the land of Benjamin. Finally, things came full circle. All was rectified and the famine came to an end. Or, as the Bible puts it, God answered the prayers of the land. According to the first book of Kings, one of the first orders of business of the young King Solomon 
after completing the necessary actions needed to secure his throne, was none other than a pilgrimage to the city of Giv'on. The Bible describes that the king went to Giv'on to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. But what was the purpose behind King Solomon's visit to Giv'on? Why was it so important for him to go there, of all places, shortly after becoming king over Israel? And what was the nature of his celebration in which he offered a thousand sacrifices? Perhaps the best clues relating to Solomon's visit to Givon are to be found in the second book of Chronicles, which portrays the same event in greater detail. The verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 describe how Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the officers of the thousands and the hundreds, to the judges, to every ruler in all of Israel, and to the heads of families. And Solomon, along with the entire congregation, went to the high place at Giv'on, for God's tent of meeting, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had erected in the wilderness, was there. However, David had brought up the ark of God from Kiryat Yarim to the place that David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. So the first thing we learn from this description is that Solomon's pilgrimage to Giv'on was no small event, but one of national magnitude, an occasion that attracted leaders and dignitaries of every level. Secondly, we learn that the so-called Great High Place at Givon, referred to in the Book of Kings, was none other than the tabernacle. This tabernacle, which according to the Jewish tradition stood for nearly 50 years, was built after the destruction of the city of Nov by King Saul and was in fact the last place in which the sanctuary stood prior to the building of the temple in Jerusalem. So now that we've learned that the tabernacle was located at Givon, things become clearer. First, we better understand why the battle between the men of Ner and Yoav occurred specifically at Givon. Givon was the most important city at the time, as it was the place in which God's sanctuary stood, and accordingly, the place in which the opposing forces struggled to gain a foothold. It also sheds light on the rather enigmatic decree given by Joshua that the Gibeonites were to become hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. For it was indeed in their city that the house of God eventually stood. But perhaps the most interesting thing in these verses is the mention of King David's bringing of the Ark of the Covenant from Kiryat Yarim to Jerusalem. Since it had been King David who brought the Ark the vessel which embodies God's divine presence, it was only natural for him to be the one who would establish the location of God's final resting place upon Mount Moriah. However, in a sense, God's presence is only complete when man plays his part as well. And so, it is as if these verses are intimating that after the ark was brought by King David to Jerusalem, there was still one more thing that needed to be done. But what was it? Let us continue reading the description in 2 Chronicles. Moreover, the copper altar that Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Chur, had made was placed before the tabernacle of the Lord. So Solomon and the congregation sought it. So it would appear from this verse that the purpose behind Solomon's visit to Givon was none other than the altar of burnt offering. In this light, the event could be understood as a ceremony in which as a final preparation for the building of the temple, the altar was transferred from the tabernacle at Giv'on to Jerusalem. Accordingly, Solomon's 1,000 offerings represent a final tribute paid upon the tabernacle altar before it was transferred to its permanent location in Jerusalem. Solomon's mission was thus to bring to Jerusalem the altar of burnt offering, which is the embodiment of man's devotion, and to unite it with the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's divine presence in the world. Together, the Ark of the Covenant and the Altar of Burnt Offering represent the template for the fulfillment of the ultimate covenant, the two-way relationship of man and God. God through the indwelling of His divine presence among man, as manifest through the Ark, and man through His service at the altar, in which He subdues His base nature and reaches out beyond Himself with devotion to the Creator. 
With this in mind, we can return to the description in 1 Kings. It was that night, during his visit to Giv'on, that Solomon experienced his well-known dream, the dream in which he was promised ultimate wisdom. Behold, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, such that there has never been anyone like you before, nor will anyone like you ever arise. And what is a greater wisdom than the wisdom needed to build the sanctuary, the knowledge of unifying heaven and earth? The next morning, Solomon awoke and began his short trip back to Jerusalem. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it had been a dream. When he came to Jerusalem, he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and brought up elevation offerings and offered peace offerings, and he made a feast for all his servants. It was now time for all people to wake up from their collective dream, from the illusion of separateness. It was time to build the temple. Because after all, a covenant is sacred and must be kept.